events. Someone once said that coming events cast their shadows before them. This is actually an idiom or a sin. It really means that the nature of an event may be felt before it takes place. As our shadows go before us, so oftentimes God allows coming events to predict what is about to take place before it happens. In the book Education, page 152, Ellen White says this, As an educator, no part of the Bible is of greater values than are its biographies. Biographies, she says, study the experiences of Joseph, of Moses, of Daniel, and of David. You know, we are, we, we tend to focus heavily on the prophecies, and this is true, the prophecies do need our attention. But my dear friends, in our studies, we must also actually give fair share of time to studying the biographies of the men and women in the Bible who have gone before us and have left us a legacy. And in their lives, in their experiences, we can draw comfort and we can draw strength. And so today, we're going to study the life of Joseph, some experience from Joseph's life, and see how and see what they are saying to us as we're looking forward to the coming crisis and the coming of Jesus. Now, we'll be using a method of teaching that is entitled the, the, the catechism, which is to ask the question, and then we'll go to the Bibles, the Bible for the answers. So we're going to ask the questions, and then we'll go to the Bible for the answer. Now, we're going to begin now. Number one says now, according to the scriptures, how many things work for the Christians? Good. Let's go to Romans. Romans chapter one. According to the scriptures, how many things work for the Christians? Good. Romans chapter 1. The Apostle Paul says this now. Are we there? Romans chapter 1. The Bible says now. And we know that all, emphasis, underscore, A-L-L. -L. It didn't say some or half. He says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. All things, whether uh, sickness and health, poverty and wealth, whether, whether wh whatever you find yourselves in, if you are a Christian, brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us that these things are working for our good, yea, even for the glory of God. I like what Charles Spurgeon said. He says, he, God, hath sway and all things serve his might. All things, my dear friends, are working for our good. Now, question number two now says now, now how many times was Joseph sold? The Bible lists two times. One, in Genesis 37 through 38, we find Joseph was sold by his brothers to the Midianites. As a matter of fact, if you go to Psalms 105, let's go to Psalms 105. David actually captures um, the, 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 them selling Joseph to the Midianites. Psalms 105. Let's go to Psalms 105. And we want to focus on verses 16 through 18. Psalms 105, verses 16 through 18. The Bible says in Psalms 105, verse 16, Moreover, he called for a famine in the land. He broke the whole staff of bread. Verse 17 says, he, set a man, he sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant. The Bible says in verse 18, whose feet they hurt with fetters, he was laid in iron as he was sold by his brethren to the Midianites and now being transported to Egypt. So the Bible captures the first selling of Joseph by his brethren to the Midianites. Now, Joseph is sold a second time. And this is found in Genesis chapter uh, uh, 37, verse number six. Joseph is now sold to Potiphar. So he was sold to the Midianites, right? And then the Bible says now that he was now sold to, the, to Potiphar. Now, remember our, our theme text. All things are working together for our good. In the book, Patriarchs and Prophet, Ellen White now captures 
Joseph's situation as he is now in Egypt after being sold a second time. And I want to read, and this is taken from Patriarchs and Prophet, page 217. She says, Arriving in Egypt, Joseph was sold to Potiphar, captain of the king's guard, in whose service he remained for 10 long years, brothers and sisters. He was here exposed to temptations of no ordinary character. The sights and sounds and vices were all about him, but he was as one who saw and heard not. You know, oftentimes we may find ourselves in situations and places, brothers and sisters, that we ourselves have no control over. But let's take a page from Joseph's life. He was one who saw and heard not. Now, I want you to remember that Joseph did not have any, anyone to rely on. He didn't have any source of comfort. It was just Joseph himself and God alone. She goes on to say, his thoughts were not permitted to linger on forbidden subjects. The desire to gain the favor of the Egyptians could not cause him to conceal his principles. She says, he had, had he attempted to do this, he would have become overcome by temptation, but he was not ashamed of the religion of his fathers. And he made no effort to hide the fact that he was a worshiper of Jehovah. So here we see now Joseph finds himself in Potiphar's house. Potiphar now puts him in charge of all his affairs. And the Bible now says, let's go to Genesis 39 now. We're kind of, we're laying a foundation for this morning's message, the years of the fat cows. In Genesis 39, verses 1 through 5, the Bible says this now. Genesis chapter 39, let's go here quickly. Let's focus on verse 2. Genesis chapter 39, beginning at verse number 2. And the Bible says this now. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And the Bible says, and his master saw that the Lord was with him and the Lord, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hands. Joseph was like King Midas. Everything Joseph touched had turned to gold because he had made Jehovah his refuge. God began to, to prosper Joseph. And even Potiphar realized that the blessings of, of, of God the God of the Hebrews was upon this young man. But brothers and sisters, I, I want to say this. Whenever God begins to bless you and to prosper you, watch out because the devil is always there seeking to bring you down. In Genesis chapter 39, now we see another situation. Genesis 39 verses 7 and 12. Joseph is actually in about the house doing Potiphar's business. And Mrs. Potiphar saw Joseph and that he was a fair young man and she set her eyes on Joseph. Now in Genesis 39, let's go there. Genesis 39, quickly, look at verse number seven and 12. Joseph is in the house doing his business for his master Potiphar. And in Genesis 39, verse seven, the Bible says now, and it came to pass after these things, that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and said, lie with me, have an affair with me, commit fornication with me, help me to commit adultery. Brothers and sisters, this woman was bold. She was very brazen. She was very outright, out forthright speaking in her seductiveness. And in verse number 12, the Bible says now, and she caught him by his garment saying again, lie with me. And he left his garments in her hand and he fled out and got him out. Brothers and sisters, sometimes we will find ourselves in certain situations and temptations where you may have to do like Joseph. You may have to run. Joseph ran for his life, ran for his, to preserve his spirituality. Now, Ellen White says this now. She comments now. She says, Joseph's faith and integrity were tested, were to be tested by fiery trials. 
his master's wife endeavored to entice the young man to transgress the law of God. Are you with me? Which is the seventh commandment. Heretofore, he had remained untainted by the corruption teeming in that heathen land. But this temptation, get it now, get the pathos, the power. It was so sudden. It was so strong. It was so seductive. It was sudden, caught him by surprise. It was strong, like a lion, overwhelming, and it was so seductive. Three S's. She says, how should he, how should it be met? Joseph knew what would be the consequence of his resistance. On one hand, were concealment, favor, and reward if he would commit this act. Potiphar's wife would bless him. She would buy him a, a, a golden chariot, nice horses, silk uh, attire. Are you with me? But on the other hand, were disgrace, imprisonment, and death. Joseph was now caught between a rock and a hard spot. We're told his whole life depended upon, upon the decision of this one moment. Brothers and sisters, what we will be, we are now becoming. And I want to say this, if we begin to transgress the law of God now, when the law is passed that will require us to break the law of God, what do you think we will be doing? What you will be, you are now becoming. And we, we will reap the even of life in the morning. She said, would principle triumph? Would Joseph, would Joseph still be true to God? With inexpressible anxiety, the angels looked upon the scene. So the, the scene now changes. Joseph runs out of the house, runs out of the house. And in Genesis now, chapter 40, 39, verse 14. Now look at that verse now. The Bible says now, when Potiphar's wife realized she could not get her way, demons now Enter this woman and look what she did. Now, the Bible says now that she called the man of the house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought an Hebrew in to mock us. He came in to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice, Lying lips, which are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. In Genesis 29, 39, verses 21. 2021, the Bible says now, Joseph is now apprehended. Joseph is now apprehended. And look what happened in verse 20. The Bible says now, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison and placed him in the king's prison, were bound, and he was there in prison. Now, friends, let's back up. Let's back up. I don't believe for a moment that Potiphar believed that Joseph did this to his wife. I don't believe that. But to appease his wicked wife, Potiphar could have investigated the matter. He could have asked Joseph, what was this real truth? And oftentimes, brothers and sisters, to please the crowd, we tend to compromise and sacrifice other people for our own well-being. If Potiphar had believed that Joseph had done this, I believe, in those days, in, in, in the Egyptian um, culture, the, one of the consequences of rape would be castration. Yes, it was. Are you with me? So the very fact that he placed him in the king's prison, not just any prison, it shows that Potiphar did not really believe that Joseph had done that, that wicked act. The Bible says now in verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph. Amen. Brothers and sisters, all things work together for good. How could this work for Joseph's good? The Bible says, right? But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. Amen. And he gave him favor in the Amen. sight of the keepers of the prison. So even in the dungeons, God had not forgotten Joseph. And I want to say this, my brothers and sisters. Even in your current situation right now, what you're going through, it may be discouragement or depression. Maybe somebody has maligned your character or, 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 or seeking to ruin your reputation. Brothers and sisters, let go and let God. God is still working for your good. Let us take a page from the life of Joseph. 
Genesis chapter 40 now. I'm heading somewhere. I haven't forgotten my title, The Years of the Fat Cows. Joseph is now in prison and he is made the overseer of the prison. And one day Joseph now sees two prisoners that are a little bit discouraged and downcast and depressed. Joseph now goes over there to see if he can help. Patriarchs and Prophet Ellen White now comments and she says this now. The chief butler and the chief, the chief baker, pardon me, and the, and, and the chief butler of the king had been cast in prison for some offenses. They came under Joseph's charge. One morning, observing that they appeared very sad, he kindly inquired the cause and was told that each had a remarkable dream of which they were anxious to learn the significance. She says, Joseph now says to them, do not interpretations belong to God, said Joseph. Tell me then, I pray you, as each related a dream, Joseph made known to his import. In three days, the butler was to be reinstated in his position and to give the cup into Pharaoh's hand as before. But the chief butler would be put to death, uh-oh, by the king's command. In both cases, the event occurred as foretold. Joseph then said to the cupbearer, the cupbearer, think on me, he said, when it is well with thee, show kindness, I pray unto thee, unto me. Make mention of me unto Pharaoh and bring me out of this house. Indeed, for I was stolen away from the land of my Hebrews and, and, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me in dungeon. Joseph, I beseech you, remember when you are reinstated, do not forget me. Remember the kindness that God had showed uh, to, uh, to you through me. Remember, brothers and sisters, the record says, the chief butler was reinstated. And in Genesis chapter 40, 40, verse 23, the Bible says now, yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph. He forgot Joseph. He forgot Joseph's kindness. He forgot Joseph's hospitality. He forgot Joseph's uh, comfort that Joseph gave him in his time of need. But remember, God was still with Joseph. God is now working things out for Joseph's good. Ellen White says this in Page and Prophet. She says now, for two years longer, Joseph remained in prison. The hope that had been kindled in his heart gradually died out. And to all other trials were added the sting of ingratitude. When we do things for people, when we show kindness to our, even our children, our household, our brothers and sisters, our family members, and when they should uh, give, give a word of thanks or a word of appreciation, brothers and sisters, they show a little a, a level of ingratitude. My grandfather would oftentimes say, call me what you will, but do not call me ungrateful. He was appreciative of everything that somebody did for him. But here we see that the butler had forgotten about Joseph. And for two more years, Joseph had to remain in a dungeon. Now remember, all things are working together for the good of Joseph. And God was with Joseph. Now we're going to shift now to another scene. Now remember, I haven't forgotten my title, The Years of the Fat Cow. Question number three now says now, how many dreams did Pharaoh dream? Let's go to Genesis chapter 41 now. Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41, the Bible says now in verse one, and it came to pass that the end of the two full years, why did the Bible list two full years? It was the end of the two full years that Joseph um, had been disappointed after he had asked the butler to remember him. You see how God is, God, is, God is working this thing now, right? For his good. The Bible says now, and it came to pass at the end of the full years that Pharaoh dreamed. And behold, he stood by the river. 
and behold, there came up out of the river seven, underscore seven. Seven is God's number. Seven is a prophetic number. Seven is the most mentioned number in the Bible. Seven, well, favored, keen, fat leashed, and they fed off the meadow. Verse two says, and behold, seven other keen came up after them out of the river ill-favored and lean fattish and stood by the other keen upon the brink of the river the ill-favored and the lean fattish keen did eat up the seven well-favored and fattish keen and pharaoh woke up out of his sleep what a strange dream for him to have i could imagine he was sweat anxiety his heart began to palpitate as he what could this mean why seven fat cows and seven skinny cows and the seven skinny cows ate up the fat cows and the seven skinny cows are still skinny what mean is this he goes back to sleep again now a second time and the bible says now and he slept and dreamed a second time and behold seven years of corn came up upon one stalk ranked and good and behold, seven thin ears blasted with the east wind sprang up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven ranked and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Pharaoh then, verse 8 says, And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none in the land of Egypt. Egypt was the most civilized, cultured, advanced nation, most powerful nations at that time in history. And there was no one in the Pharaoh's palace that could give the dream or the interpretation. And all of a sudden, I could imagine, like a lightning bolt, uh, the, the butler remembered, oh my Lord, oh, I remember when I was in prison and there was a Hebrew man who told me my dream and I should have made mention of him to Pharaoh. But you see, it wasn't God's time. We're told God's purposes knows no haste nor delay. Friends, we can't hurry God. We can't rush God. God works after his own timetable. Bible says in Genesis chapter 41 now. Look how the scene, the, the scene shifts now. Let's go to Genesis chapter 41 now. Genesis 41. Let's now focus on verse number 14. Genesis 41. I want you to keep your finger at Genesis 41 now. Look at verse 14 now. The Bible says now. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. And they brought him hastily after two full years out of the dungeons. And he shaved himself. He shaved himself. Interesting. And he changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. Let me stop there, brothers and sisters. Joseph did not just go in the presence of Pharaoh anyhow, any old way. This is a lesson for us as we come into the presence of God. This presence can be even in our home as we assemble for worship, brothers and sisters. There is a level of decorum. There's a level of dress that, that is appropriate for worship, even in the home, yea, even in the church. And we have come to a point in the history of the remnant church where people don't know where they're going. And we are told in the spirit of prophecy that we should not wear common clothes in the presence of God, brothers and sisters. There ought to be a special, special attire that has been designated and designed for when we go to the house of God. It doesn't matter if you have one or two. Let that be set aside for going into the presence of God. And we hear this thing today in Christianity, come as you are. And people come to God any old how. But brothers and sisters, we don't go before kings as we are. We take a shower. We go in debt. We, go on, we use our credit card to purchase a tire that is befitting for the occasion. But when we come in the house of God, we show up any old way with dirty clothes and, and dirty shoes going before a holy God. This ought not be Joseph. Knew he was going in the presence of a heathen king, a pagan king. 
and Joseph shaved himself. He changed his attire because he was going before the king. Verse 15 says, And Pharaoh said unto him, I have dreamed a dream, and therefore there is none that can interpret it. And I have here say unto thee that thou canst understand a dream and interpret it. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says now, this is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showed unto Pharaoh. So God, Joseph now is interpreting a dream. Behold, there came up seven years of, behold, there, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And there shall arise after them seven years of famine. And all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt. And the famine shall consume the land. Verse 31 says now, Joseph now adds emphasis. He says, and the plenty shall not be known in the land by the reason of the famine following, for it shall be very grievous. A grievous famine now. Number four now. Question number four. In essence, what did Joseph predict would come upon Egypt? Joseph predicted a time of trouble. This time of trouble, follow me now, would be physical. It would take the posture and the position of famine. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes um, 1 9, that which was is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. There is no new thing under the sun. Coming events cast their shadows before it happens. Are you with me? Joseph predicted a time of trouble. This was a physical time of trouble for physical food. Now, look what happens now. Question number five now. Where in the scriptures do we find another uh, predicted famine? Go to Amos. Amos chapter eight. Amos chapter eight. Verse 11, where in scriptures do we find another famine predicted to take place more serious and more grievous than the one that happened in Egypt over 4,000 years ago? Go to Amos chapter 8. Let's go to Amos quickly now. Amos chapter 8. Amos 8, look at verse number 11 and 12. Amos chapter 8, are we there? Amos 8, the Bible says now, verse 11 says, Behold the days come saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine for bread, nor a thirst for water, but for hearing the words of the Lord. The Bible says in verse 12, and they shall wander from sea to sea. Who are the they? We don't want to be a part of the they, brothers and sisters. From sea to sea, sea in prophet symbolize multitudes of people and nations, and even from the north, to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek a word of the Lord, and they shall not find it. Brothers and sisters, the famine that Amos here predicted is not a physical famine, but it is a spiritual famine, a famine for the word of God. Go back to Genesis now. Genesis chapter 41. Go there quickly. Genesis chapter 41. So here we see a spiritual Famine is coming. And my brothers and sisters, if we want to survive this famine, we must do what Joseph did in the physical so we can, so we can survive the spiritual. Genesis chapter 41. Look at verse number 32. The Bible says now, And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, because the thing is established by God, and God will bring it to pass shortly. So when God gave him the dream twice, it meant it was fixed. It was fastened. It was firm. And it would come to pass shortly. So we see the famine, but we also see urgency. It's coming. And Pharaoh only had a short time to prepare. He had seven years. Now, friends, it's not just good for for us to highlight the crisis, but do not give any solution for the crisis. You see, Joseph, he highlighted, he spoke of the problem, 
but Joseph also gave a solution. Verse 33 now, says this now. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise. What does discreet mean? Discreet meant quiet, not chatty chatty. Discreet, a person who doesn't let his left hand know what the right hand is doing. Discreet and wise, and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this, and let him appoint officers over the land to take up a fifth part of the land in the seven plenteous years. They only had seven years to prepare for the famine. Verse 35 says now, let them gather all the food of those good years to come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh. Let them keep the food in the cities. 36 says, and the food shall be in store, underscore store, circle store, or a storehouse in the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, and the land shall perish, not through the famine. We're told in page some prophet, Ellen White says now, the dream of Pharaoh is one, said Joseph. God showed Pharaoh what he's about to do. There was to be seven years of great plenty, Field and gardens would yield more abundantly. God did this because it is God who has, who has control of vegetation. Then, before, right, the famine shall be grievous, she says, the repetition of the dream was evident of both the certainty and the nearness of the fulfillment. Now, therefore, he continued, let Pharaoh look out a man wise and discreet. Let, let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take a fifth part of the land in the seven plenty years. Let him gather all the food in the good years to come. Lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh so when the famine comes, and brothers and sisters now, look how God works. I love this. This is so encouraging, brothers and sisters. As Pharaoh surveyed his palace, the spirit impressed Pharaoh to choose the man called Joseph. Have mercy. God was working things out for the good of Joseph. All things are working for our good. Now, brothers and sisters, you see that Joseph then becomes a type of Seventh-day Adventists living in the last days, living in the years of the fat cows. Note, we are told, Every institution established by Seventh-day Adventists is to be to the world what Joseph was in Egypt. The same mentality that Joseph had, we who are looking forward to the coming crisis must adopt that same mentality. Joseph now begins to gather a fifth part of all the grains and he began to store them in storehouse in lieu, in anticipation to the coming crisis. Joseph understood that once the years of the fat cows came off the scene, the years of the skinny cows would come. Friends, I believe now today that we have been living, hear me now, in the years of the fat cows plentiful since 1798. That is a date that can be proven in the Bible. Let's go to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12 speaks of the years of the fat cows under a different disguise. Daniel chapter 12, verse number four. The Bible says in Daniel 12, verse number four, the Bible says now, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words, seal up the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So friends, there are two things the text speaks of. Once the time of the end began, two things would happen. There'd be a running to and fro, and the second thing, that there would be a burst of knowledge 
that has not been seen since the apostolic age. Knowledge would increase, and that is the years of the fat cow. So since 1798, we have been, time of the end, we have been living in the years of the fat cows, the years of plentiful. Now, look what happened now. We realize that the, the Catholic Church came on the scene in the year 538 um, AD. They reigned for 1260 years, and the, the papacy lost its, its supremacy in the year 1798, bringing to an end the years of the Dark Ages. So here we see now, once the Dark Ages ended, with the time of the end now, there would be a burst of knowledge that would come on the scene, which will lead to the second spiritual famine. Now, friends, in Roger Monroe's book, A Trip into the Supernatural World, Roger Monroe tells of an experience that he had with some Satanist worship about Satan's plan for the Dark Ages and the end of the Dark Ages. I read. This is the high priest now speaking to Roger Monroe. Gentlemen, I believe by now you realize the master's great wisdom. This is the high priest speaking now, right? And cleverness in concealing his true identity. It assures his dedicated agents that their diligence will be rewarded someday when they see the generation of earth standing before, before them in humble obedience, acknowledging that their master is in reality the great God, the great master. He continued to leave nothing to chance. He says now, with well-matured plans and great care, he lays his sneers to captivate the minds of millions of the wisest mortals and thus secure their allegiance both in this present life and for eternity. With vibrant enthusiasm now, he says now, quoting, that Satan, for Satan's cause, the man, the high priest in Satan's kingdom, proceed to tell about what he called the most awesome assembly of spirit beings ever converge in any one place on the face of the planet. At the beginning of the 18th century, which is the end of the Dark Ages, he said, Satan and his spirit councils held a great general council to prepare for the industrial age. Are you with me? That would soon break upon the world. Satan foresaw that an age of scientific discovery and intellectual enlightenment would immediately follow his heel. Use the fat cows. And it would usher in the end times and close the struggle of good and evil. He said Satan was studying Daniel 12, verse 4, and he understood that 7 8 is the time of the end. Now, don't confuse that with 1844. 1844 is the end of time. They are not the same dates. They are different, evade, different dates and different events. Now, he said Satan had four objectives for the time of the end, which is 1798, which is also the years of the fat cow. Here they are. One, he would convince human beings that Satan doesn't exist. And so he has. Number two, he would seek to obtain total control over people by introducing hypnotism as a new beneficial science. Men of great learning said the spirits would perpetuate the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. Number three, Satan would try to destroy the Bible without burning it. And that was where the French Revolution came, came on the scene, right? And then he said, now Satan actually um, handpicked three individuals, Emmanuel Swedenborg, Franz Gall, and Antoine Mesmer, which is in the spirit of prophecy. We get the word mesmerism. So friends, Satan knew that once the Dark Ages ended, it would usher in now the years of the fat cows, the years of plentiful. Are you with me? The Bible says now, at the time of the end, men shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. Look at the to and fro. This means that um, it can also symbolize missionary activities. People leave in England, go into China. Are you with me? Missionary activities. It can also symbolize travel people using airplanes and ships, right? 
But he said, knowledge shall increase. What kind of knowledge? Scientific knowledge. Um, invention knowledge. But also knowledge in regards to the scriptures, which were hidden in the dark ages. You see, friends, so 1798 marks the beginning of the years of the fat cows. Now, the Adventist commentary says, when the seal book is open at the time of the end, knowledge concerning the truths contained in these prophecies will increase. At the end of the 18th and of the 19th century, new interest would, in the prophecies of Daniel would, and Revelation would be awakened widely, right, in different places of the earth. The study of these prophecies would lead to a widespread belief in the second coming of Christ. Numerous Bible expositors like Joseph Wolf in the Middle East, Manuel Lacanza in South America, William Miller in America together, and a host of other students would declare that Christ is soon to come. And this launched what was called the Advent Movement, Daniel 8:14. So, friends. Of a certainty, we have been living in the years of the fat cows. But remember, once the years of the fat cows came on the scene, Pharaoh's dream said, shortly after, the years of the skinny cows would come on the scene. Friends, it is only what they stored up in the years of the plentiful would sustain them in the years of the famine. And so it is, friends. It is only what we store up now will keep us when the famine hits this world. So Joseph built storehouses and he preserved the grains in those seven years of the plenty. Now, we know a famine is coming. We see the parallel. Now, let's think now. Joseph had to build storehouses then. Our storehouse must be the mind. What the storehouse was for Joseph in Egypt, our mind is our storehouse. These millions of brain cells. What are you storing up in your storehouse? Friends, everybody is storing up something in their storehouse. And I believe that there are five things, I believe that all of us who are watching right now should, should seek to gather as much as we can to store up in our brains while we are now living in the years of the fat cows. The first thing I believe that all of us should store up is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Friends, this is paramount. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. The first thing we want to gather as much as we can in the years of plentiful is that relationship with Jesus Christ. Philippians 3.10, the apostle Paul says, that I may know him. And when Paul wrote this, this was not the unconverted Paul. This is the converted Paul. Paul is saying that I may know him. Who is him? Jesus. And the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, right? Paul said, oh, that I may know him. Friends, do you know Jesus? You know, there are different levels of knowing a person. I can say that I know Elder Noel Chachate. I know Elder Zoom. I know Elder Kudzai. But do I really know them? Uh, maybe not. Do I know what, 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 what is their favorite color? Do I know what food they like? Do I know their shoe size? No. So do I really know him? No. I know him in a certain context, but do I know him totally? When Paul said that I may know him, we, he wants us to know Jesus totally. And one of the saddest words that Christ will utter from his lips were, I never knew you. Friends, let's get to know Jesus. And there are books that can help us. Books like Steps to Christ, Christ's Object Lesson, Thoughts from the amount of blessings, even the desire of ages. Ellen White says this. 
in mercy to the world, Jesus delays his coming that sinners may have an opportunity to hear the warning and find a shelter in him before the wrath of God is poured out. Friends, I appeal to you, let's get to know Jesus. You may not know all the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. You should know everything about Jesus. Get to know Jesus for yourself. Begin with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and get these books. These books, along with, will help us to form that relationship with Jesus Christ for ourselves. So the first thing I believe that we should gather up in the years of plentiful is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The second thing I believe that we should gather up in the years of the spiritual fat cows is a knowledge of what we believe. Friends, do you know what you believe? I'm talking to you, my brother and my sister. Do your children know what they believe? Or do they spend more time on technology, on watching foolishness on, 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 on the internet? Do they know what they believe? Do you know what you, do I know what I believe? First Peter 3, 15 says this, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that is in you with fear and meekness. There was a time when you saw a Seventh-day Adventist, you would not mess with them because they knew the word of God. There was a time when Jehovah's Witness would run from us. Now the tables have turned. We are running from Jehovah's Witness. When they knock on our doors, we, tell our, we hide and tell our kids to say, we are not home. And it is lying. There was a time where Jehovah's Witness would run from us. Now we run from them. Every Adventist should know, what do I believe? Why do I believe it? And where do I find it? We are told, gospel workers, she says, I have been shown that many who profess to have a what? Of present truth, know not what they believe. They do not understand the evidence of their faith. And until tested, they don't know their ignorance. And there are many in our churches who take it for granted that they understand what they believe. But until a controversy or a crisis arises, they do not know their own weakness. Or when separated from the prayer line or Zoom and compelled to stand alone and explain their belief from scriptures, they do not know what they believe. Friends, too many of us, we have what is called the lean to religion. Mr. Spurgeon said this, if the minister or some elder or some leading person was taken away, their back wall would be gone and they would come to the ground. In some cases, the wife and the mother or the husband and the father or the friend or the teacher constitute the main support of that individual's religion. He leans upon others. And if these fail him, there is an end to their hope. He says you cannot in all your long life have these good people to be your supporters. And if you would have them in life, they must be separated from you by death. Friends, I appeal to you. It's time for you to start studying for yourself. Buy the books. Read them for yourselves. Understand the prophecies of Revelation and Daniel for yourselves. Understand the doctrines for yourself. Parents, I beseech you, teach your children the belief system. I was just impressed and encouraged and inspired and refreshed as I listened to the little children this morning, leading out, reading excerpts 
from the great controversy about the wall dances. I commend you, my dear sister. God bless you and all the children. Keep it up. Keep it up. Keep it up. So we must learn what we believe. The third thing I believe that we need to get in the year of plentiful. Friends, we must learn, oh Lord, the lessons of faith. We must learn to develop a strong faith in Jesus. We're going to need faith to go through the coming crisis. Revelation 12, 14, verse 12. The Bible says now, let's go to Revelation 14, 12. Now, we need a strong faith. We need, we need that relation with Jesus. What we believe, but we also need the lessons to learn the lessons of faith. Revelation 12, 14 says now, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. It didn't say faith in Jesus. That is important. We must have the faith of Jesus. We're told this. She says the faith of Jesus has been overlooked and treated with indifference. Careless manner. It has not occupied a prominent position in which it was revealed to John. We must uplift this teaching. Then she says, now, this season of distress and anguish before us will require a faith that can endure weariness, delay, and hunger, a faith that will not faint, though severely tried. And God has given us this opportunity in the years of the fat cows to develop this faith. It's like, it's like, um, it's like working muscles. It's like, I remember when I had my surgery, I had a surgery uh, a few years ago, a rotator cup surgery. I had suffered a, a football, a soccer injury, football injury. My shoulder would, would always pop out. And when I had the surgery, I, I, I kind of work out and my arm, I had pretty strong muscles. And brothers and sisters, when I had the surgery, for six weeks, I was out of commission. I had my arm in a sling. And I could see that the muscle mass began to subside and to shrink. When I looked in the mirror, this arm was bigger, 10 times bigger than this arm. Even today, you can still see a difference. And I, as I got back in the gym, I began to work. And what I would do, when I would do my reps, if I did um, 10 here, I would do 15 here because the extra five was to try to compensate for this. And as I began to work it, work it, work it, work it, by and by, the shoulder got bigger. Friends, it's just like faith. It's something we develop over time. And we are in a position now where we can trust God in the little things. Trust God to supply your needs. Believe that God will save you. And as we develop this faith now, when the crisis comes, when the famine comes, we'd have enough faith stored up to keep us through the famine. The fourth thing I believe that we need to gather up all we can in the years of plentiful is the science of physiology. Physiology. Let's go to the book of Psalms. Psalms 139 verse 14. Psalms 139, verse number 14. We need to learn the lessons of faith, what we believe. Also, we must have that relationship with Jesus Christ. Psalms 139, David says, I will praise thee, for I am fearful and wonderfully made. This is the lesson of physiology. We are told in Helpful Living to become acquainted with the wonderful human or organism, the bones, the muscles, the stomach, the liver, the bowels, the heart, the pores of the skin, which is the largest organ, and to understand their dependence of one organ upon another for the helpful action is a study in which most take no interest. It is best for those who claim to be sons of God and daughters to avail themselves while they can of the opportunities. She says, right? Um, the Lord will not work a miracle to preserve the health of any who make no effort to obtain uh, within his reach knowledge concern the habitation that God has given him. In order to be fitted for translation, 
the people of God must know themselves. Friends, we must understand physiology, how the body works, how we can take care of it. And in the years of the fat cows, when books are at our fingertips, where we can go online and read up and research things, many are negligent. Let's get back to the study of physiology, right? So here we see now, the first thing we need to do, we need to get that relationship with Jesus Christ. Number two, we need to know what we believe. Number three, number three, right? Lessons of faith. Number four, physiology. Number five now, we need to understand the medical missionary work, brothers and sisters. How to use simple remedies that will alleviate suffering. Go to the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 1, um, 139, 104, 104, verse 14. Psalms 104. Psalms 104. Psalms 104. Look at verse number 14. 104, verse number 14, right? Right? I, I have 139, but it's wrong. It should, it should say Psalms 104. Verse 14 says now, He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man. Brothers and sisters, we are told God has placed within creation certain herbs that can help us to wrestle with certain diseases. We are told, medical missionary, the medical missionary work is of a heavenly origin. She says, the medical missionary work is the right arm of the gospel. All of us should understand some natural remedies, brothers and sisters, that will help to facilitate healing. She says in um, volume seven of the testimonies, page 62, she says, we have come to a time when every member of the church should take hold of the medical mission. All of us, you get the books by, by, by Vance Farrell, Harvest Time. You understand the, the natural remedy books. You, you understand physiology. See and learn how remedies can help to fight. She says, nothing will open doors for the work like the evangelistic medical missionary work. This will find access to the hearts and minds and will be a means of converting into the truth. They will reason that if we have such sound ideas in regards to health and temperance, there must be something in our religious belief that is worth investigating. If we backslide on health reform, we shall lose much of our influence with the world. And then she says now, right? Gather up all the knowledge possible that will help you to combat diseases. This may be done by those who are diligent students, but few can take a course of training in the medical institution, but all can study our health literatures and become intelligent on this important subject. All of us can't go to Wildwood or Yuji Pine or, or, or meet ministries, but the books are within we can purchase the books, get our families together, and understand the medical missionary work, understand the diseases. Brothers and sisters, in the years of the fat cows, I beseech you, let us gather up all we can in the years of plentiful, while things are readily accessible to us, while books are on our shelves, brothers and sisters. Now, this is the question now. When does the years of the fat cows come to its close. It must come. We know back in Joseph's days, it was at the end of the seventh year, seventh year, right? When does the, when does the famine take place for us? Number six now, what prophetic event will mark the beginning of Amos 8, 11, or the years of the fat cows, skinny cows? Let's go to Daniel 12, verse 1. Daniel 12, verse 1 <clears throat> tells us the event that will mark the beginning of the years of the fat cows. Skinny cows, skinny cows, pardon me, skinny cows. Daniel 12 says now, and at that time shall Michael stand up 
the great prince, prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to the same time. At that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone found in the book. This is the close of probation. Jesus finishes his intercession in the heavenly sanctuary. This now, we now transition to the years of the skinny cow. And in early writings, page 281, Ellen White was given a vision of the years of the skinny cows, of people who did not capitalize on the years of the fat cows. They would rather go to football matches, watch, uh, watch Premier League, watch the Bundesliga. They, they were so busy making money traveling than storing up the knowledge of Jesus. And when probation now closed, they find themselves in a state of famine. She says in the book, Early Writings, page 281, those who had not prized God's word are hurrying to and fro, wandering from, see the sea, she's quoting Amos 11, from the north to the east, to seek a word, said the angel, they shall not find it. Why? There is a famine in the land, not a famine for bread or nor for thirst, for water, but for hearing the words of the Lord. They want to log on on the Zoom. Hey, no Zoom now. Zoom is shut down. They want Bible studies. They want prayer retreat. There's none of that now. There is a famine in the land. She says, what would they not give for one word of approval from God? But no, they must hunger and thirst on. Day after day, they have slighted salvation, prizing earthly riches and earthly pleasures higher than any heavenly treasure or inducement. They have rejected Jesus, despised his saints, and the filthy remains filthy forever. Revelation 20 to 11. He that is filthy, let him be filthy. So friends, when probation closes, now the masses will want to gather up. But then friends, it will be too late. Now we're in the years of the fat cows. Now is the time for us to learn all we can about the truths for this time. Now, as we close, whose example should we now be imitating in the years of the fat cows? Whose example? Is there a biblical example that we can follow? Yes, go to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11, right? Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs 6, pardon me. Proverbs chapter 6. Look at verses, verse number six now. Whose example should we be following in the years of the fat cows? Proverbs 6 says now, are we there? But go to the ant thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth, her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. Friends, we should be imitating the example of the ants. Are very, they are very, are very industrial, industrious creatures. Let's take a, a page from them. So friends, as I close, if you don't remember anything I've said, remember that since 1798, we have been living in the years of the fat cows. But soon and very soon, we are about to transition in the years of the skinny cows. It is only what we store up now will keep us for the years of famine. May God help us to be wise this Lord's day and not otherwise. Let us pray. 
loving Father in heaven, we want to thank you, dear God, that you have left us examples in the Bible that can serve as a means of instruction and encouragement as we prepare for the coming crisis and the coming of Jesus. Oh God, help us to realize the times in which we now live. Help us to make the most of time, to redeem the time, to spend more time in prayer, more time in studying, more time in witnessing, more time in taxing the mind with scripture memorization, memorizing passages, memorizing doctrines, memorizing hymns, memorizing songs, memorizing promises that will keep us as we look forward to the crisis. Bless us all, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen.